Hey bag maker, today I'm going to be talking about the Martelli Snap Caddy, various fabrics that I've added to my stash and also various patterns that I've added to my stash. I'll be talking about my top 10 board games for 2021. I'll be demonstrating how to avoid skip stitches in corners and there's a great giveaway at the end. I'm Sarah Lawson from Sew Sweetness. Thanks so much for joining me for Social Sunday, my weekly sewing chat. Hey everybody, happy Sunday and welcome to Social Sunday. Thank you so much for joining me for the show. Um, Violet and I, I have to admit, have been on a Lego flashback, if you will. When Violet was little, she loved playing Legos. We had a lot of Lego sets and we did them together. And in the last few days, we sort of recalled our love for Lego and we started building some sets. And there were a couple that we hadn't built before um, a gingerbread house that we got last year that we never built. Um, Violet finished the Harry Potter train set today and I was working on a separate sort of Christmas themed train set. So mine's not finished yet, almost. Violet finished her train and I think we'll probably try to pick up some of the past Lego sets that we've made when she was really little. I saved them all in Ziploc bags with the instructions so hopefully all of the pieces are present but it's something fun we can do together. We watch TV and we each build a separate set. We started off a few days ago at the beginning by working on the same set, but then one person would sort of have to sit idly until it was their turn. We would take turns every few steps. And so if we each have our own set, it's a lot more fun. So um, we'll, we'll see what sets we're working on over the holiday break. Um, I see Karen is watching from Florida. Uh, Kathy also from Florida. Um, also, I wanted to remind you that uh, the December challenge, there's still about a week and a half or so to enter the December challenge. There's a link in the description if you'd like to find out more information there. Lots of lovely entries um, entered into the challenge so far. And um, also my usual reminder, just about everything that I talk about during Social Sunday are things that I've purchased myself. So these are not things that I'm getting paid to talk to you about, but just cool things that I found that I'd like to share with you. And everything that I'm scheduled to talk about, I link to in the description. So if you're interested in finding out more about any of the fabrics, books, projects, or notions that I talk about during Social Sunday, just check that link in the description and you can find out more information there. So the notion of the week is uh, an, a product that Jackie emailed me uh, about um, approximately a week ago and I thought it was really cool and I thought it was something I definitely needed to have for this table where I'm sitting right now which also doubles as uh, filming for when we're filming the step videos and also when I'm cutting out fabric or working on my own projects I use this cutting table for that also so um, it is the Martelli snap caddy and Danny's going to switch to the overhead so that I can show you what it looks like. So this is the box that it comes in. Um, it seems relatively simple, but this is something honestly that I really needed. So um, I, I was really appreciative that Jackie emailed me about this. So here's the close up view. Let me show you the side view. So it's got this huge clip. So um, I can't show you how it clips onto my table because my table's off camera, but it does fit multiple widths of table space, which is really great. There's this section on the top with sort of a lip where you can put smaller items like different sewing machine feet, which is probably what I'll do with mine, um, some wonder clips to have them on hand. And if you would like to um, either a drink or if you're not drinking while you're, while you're sewing, perhaps like a, a mason jar with some other notions in there. And then there's also this double-sided storage container, which is what I was most excited about. So I can have, previously I was just, when I was filming the videos, I would just have the pile of notions off to the side. And I, I do have more notions, but uh, I don't have them all over here in this little bundle. But now I can keep them off the table. So I have more room for when we're filming. And this portion over here, it slides out. So if you need more room, you can take this out. Um, and then if you, need the space back, you can put it back in. So uh, Danny, if you wouldn't mind switching back to the overhead uh, uh, front camera, sorry. <laughs> okay, so this is what it looks like, the front on view. Here's the clip and this is where it would clip onto my table. So I have my things 
in easy reach but not taking up space on my table. So again, if you're interested in this, it is called uh, the Snap Caddy from Martelli. And Martelli has lots of cool things on their website like uh, rotating, cutting, and pressing mat, which I also have. I've talked about it on a, a show a little while ago. They have rulers, um, other notions, pressing tools. So um, check out their site for this product as well as uh, the other rules, rulers and notions uh, that they sell on their website. So I have a question for you. Let me know in the comments. Um, do you like to sip on something when you're sewing? So I usually don't, to be honest. I do keep a glass of water when I'm, uh, I try to remember to keep a glass of water near me when I'm uh, hosting the live shows, just in case my throat gets a little bit dry. But um, I know a lot of you like to have either an alcoholic beverage or perhaps a tea, uh, juice or water. So let me know in the comments if you like to sip on something while you're sewing. So um, my Christmas sewing is sort of underway. I finished uh, two of the quilts or the, the only two quilts for this holiday uh, yesterday and I gave them to the recipient yesterday as well, my trainer at the stable. And I made her two quilts. So one was a king size quilt in a design that she had chosen ahead of time and colors that she liked. So she sort of knew she was getting this quilt ahead of time. And the surprise portion of the gift was that I made the same exact quilt, but in a crib size. So I, I know this sounds, um, I guess, a bit indulgent, but I made the smaller quilt for her Australian Shepherd Arrow. So Danny's going to put a couple pictures on the screen. Um, because the other quilt is so big, this is the, the dog's quilt, the crib size quilt, and the, the king size version is the same design. Um, Judy Tucker long armed, long armed this for me. Um, she fit me in to get it uh, finished in time to be gifted before Christmas. And I was super happy with how it came out. It's a really fun quilt pattern. Actually, that particular quilt pattern, I've linked to it in the description. It's the Glacier quilt pattern. I've made it, that's the third time I've made that quilt, particular quilt. And I would have to say it's the fastest quilt that I've ever made that wasn't just um, like a charm square quilt. So something more of an intricate design than just squares. But um, yeah, it, it definitely, it was probably two to three days of sewing time, not full-time days. And um, that includes some of the cutting. And while you can piece it, just regular piecing on your sewing machine, I like using uh, foundation papers to sew half score triangles. So I use uh, the papers from It's So Emma, which you can find on the Fat Quarter Shop website. So uh, I feel like for me personally, it makes things a little bit more precise. So I use the papers and uh, I do enjoy working with foundation papers for quilting. But again, I've linked to that quilt pattern in the description in case you're interested in that. And a bunch of new fabrics I've added to my stash. I saved some back for the next few Social Sunday shows, but Danny's going to switch to the overhead camera so that I can share with you the fabrics. So this first one is from Camelot Fabrics. I saw this one on a... I can't remember if it was a triple threat briefcase or a chickadee backpack. Someone in the Facebook group used this fabric for their bag and I just loved it. So I picked up the same one. I love the black and white print. There's horses and rabbits on there. Loved it. Um, a couple of sort of, I guess, Halloween type fabrics. These are from Alexander Henry and I just really like, I like the stripes. I like the little kitty faces and the jack-o'-lanterns. So uh, a little bit of Halloween added to my stash. This next fabric, I only bought a half yard, so I think I planned for this to be a pouch. This is from Barry J. I love her fabrics, they're very painterly. And then the last three printed fabrics, at least, are from the designer August Wren. And I think these are from more than one fabric line, but I just, I love her designs. I love the animals that are featured in the fabrics. And then this one is my favorite of all three, the, the cranes. Love this one. Um, again, link to all these fabrics is in the description. And then these are fabrics from Robert Kaufman with a bit of sparkle. And I only picked up a few. There's a whole rainbow line of the these sparkly fabrics. And some of the lighter, these two lighter fabrics, the sparkle is less apparent, but I think, I think if I kind of wiggle the fabric around, you, you get the picture, there's a bunch of glitter in there. And the pink one, I like the pale pink. 
these two, the glitter, I, I can see on camera also, the glitter is very apparent, which I really love. I got this green, and this is sort of a charcoal, not completely dark black. Um, I'm not sure what I'll make with these, but I was just really intrigued with the, the glitter aspect, and I think these are definitely super attractive in person. I know they probably look a little bit attractive on camera, but I was really super pleased with these when I got these. So um, links to all of the fabrics are in the description. Um, something non-sewing related that I wanted to talk about. On a recent show, someone asked about uh, if I would share my top 10 games. And so I was thinking yesterday what games to talk about. So I decided not to feature my top 10 games of all time because I've talked about some board games and card games on past shows, but I decided to talk about my top 10 games that I've added to my board game and card game stash in 2021. So Danny's going to put a few images up on the screen and I'll just name all the games as we go through. So this game's called Canvas. You're basically competing to complete artwork. Uh, the second one is called Azul, tile laying game. Um, the next one that's coming up on the screen is called, uh, okay, thank you, Danny. It looks like Danny slowed down the, the pictures. Um, this one's called Horrified. It's with uh, basically classic movie monsters, a uh, really fun game. I like the aspect of uh, the movie monsters that everyone's perhaps familiar with. This one's called Cascadia. It's, uh, as you know, I love nature. I love the card and tiling aspect of this game, and this is also by the makers of, um, what was that cat game? Uh, it's escaping me. It'll come to me. It'll come to me. Uh, the next game is called New York Zoo. You're sort of competing to uh, put your zoos together and um, breed animals, so this one really caught my eye. This one's called Kabuto Sumo, and you're basically competing to kind of push and slide tiles off the board. So this is a, a fun one for even younger kids, uh, no reading involved. Um, this one, for dinosaur fans, this one's called Fossilus, and you're basically mining or excavating dinosaur bones, which is really fun and a lot of cool aspects to this particular game. The next one's called Climbers, also possibility for younger players, uh, wooden pieces with different sides of colors, so you're uh, competing to get to the top. Um, the next one, I really love the artwork on this game. It's called Honey Buzz, um, Bears, Honey. Um, I really love beautiful, beautiful artwork in board games, and so a lot of the games that I tend to get are have really great artwork. And this last one is called Dinosaur Island Roar and Write, so it's a uh, a dice game with uh, keeping scores. You can see like the, the paper pad over there. So um, those are my top 10 board games that I've added to my uh, board game closet, if you will, in 2021. And if you're interested in checking out any of those games further, I've linked to all of them in the description so you can check them out after the show if you would like to. So um, I have another question for you. Let me know in the comments, what is your favorite game? So um, uh, I definitely have lots of favorites. Um, I tend to like quicker games, like a half hour or less. I like a lot of uh, card games. Um, Rummy Cube is one of my favorites that the kids have played since they were little. So let me know in the comments what your favorite game is and I'll have to check out the comments after the show to see if there's any new games or card games that I can add to my stash. Okay, so in lieu of the book review for today, I'd like to show you some new, um, they happen to be all quilt patterns, but I'd like to share with share some quilt patterns that I've added to my stash. So Danny's going to flip back over to the overhead camera. This first pattern is called Pop Art Pups, and it is a, I reviewed some of Emily Taylor's, a couple of her books in the past, her collage books, and I don't know how I missed this, but this is, I love this quilt, I love dogs. I love the idea of the collage quilt, and um, so I just had to pick up this pattern. It's not a book like some of the other projects that I've featured from Emily Taylor in the past, but it's a standalone pattern. So the next few are all from the same designer, Zen Chic, and um, some new patterns came out recently, so I picked some of them up. Um, I, I just really love geometric patterns, which most of these are. 
And I have the link to the Zen Chic website um, in the description in case you're interested in checking out any of these or um, some of her other patterns. And this last pattern is actually, there's a quilt along starting, I think in approximately in February, but um, check the link in the description. I have linked to the Bauhaus uh, quilt along in the description. There's three quilt alongs I have my eye on and this is one of them. This pattern looks relatively quick, not a whole ton of blocks. So I will be going through my stash and collecting some fabrics to um, complete this quilt along. Um, Danny, if you wouldn't mind, um, actually, Danny's gonna put a couple of other pictures on the screen. Um, the first one, um, this is another quilt along Home Street. I've also linked to this one in the description. I'm perhaps getting in over my head by doing three quilt alongs, but I really love that one. That one looks um, relatively simple and straightforward. And then there's um, a third one, um, Allison Glass's Feathers Quilt Pattern, which has been out for a while. The blue colorway on the right-hand side of the screen, I've already purchased fabrics to make that blue quilt. It kind of reminds me of a Blue Jay, so I'm excited to complete that quilt. I've actually made the Feathers Quilt before years ago, and I actually should have saved the picture, which I neglected to do, but I did make the Feathers Quilt in Allison's Fabrics, but it never became a quilt because I finished the quilt top and then I cut it up to make a dress. So <laughs> um, I do still have the dress in my closet, but um, so it, it's been years since I made that quilt. So I'm excited to revisit it in that blue colorway. And uh, like I mentioned, the links to all of the quilt patterns and the quilt alongs are in the description. So in case you're interested in checking those out, um, you can do so after the show. So let's see what else. Oh, Danny's favorite part of the show. We'd like to invite all of the bag makers to stand proud. Let us know in the comments that you're part of the So Sweetness squad. Danny and I are so happy that you're here for the show, whether you're watching live or watching the recording later on in the week. And uh, we really, really, really appreciate your support. So thank you so much. All right, so my demonstration for this week is something that's sort of a simple demonstration, something really quick to demonstrate, but um, I thought it would be really helpful in just about every bag making circumstance. So I'm going to pull out a couple bags um, just to show you sort of preview what I'm going to talk about. So in this chickadee backpack, the strap, or um, if your bag has strap tabs, um, as you probably know, you're sewing this down using a little square, sometimes a little rectangle. And then I've pulled out another bag. While strap tabs are the most frequent occurrence for this particular um, annoyance, it also can happen for the bottom of your bag as well. So these tabs are rounded um, and secure to the front of the bag. And this problem can also exist for bag bottoms, such as either a curved bottom or a bottom that's a rectangle. So now that we've, I've shown you a couple of bags, um, Danny's going to switch to the overhead camera because I prepared a little sample before the show. Okay, so sewing corners or sewing bottoms of bags or strap tabs. So I prepared this little demonstration. This is just foam interfacing and I've used black thread so you can see it clearly. And as you can see, I had to sort of fool around with my little sample before I was able to get um, my um, little annoyance over here. So as you can see, when you're sewing corners, either straight corners or curved corners, you're generally pivoting with your needle. So I sewed a few, everything was fine. And then over here, if you take a look at this one, let me grab my pen. As you can see, the thread kind of cut off the corner, which is not what you want, especially when you're top stitching straps or tabs like I was showing um, before I pulled out this sample. So um, how to avoid this, this little skip stitch in the corner. So I'm going to move over to my sewing machine so we can talk about this a little bit before I demonstrate it on my machine. So <clears throat> I've linked to in the description a little cartoon illustration of um, basically how a sewing machine works explained in a GIF. So if you're interested in checking that out, it's literally like a two second long illustration. And basically it illustrates how a sewing machine works when your needle is going up and down um, and grabbing the bobbin thread. So um, I'm gonna pull my bobbin casing out. Your bobbin casing might either be in the side of your machine or you might have like a, 
a little door or a clear window on the top of your machine. Um, regardless, either works. So here's my bobbin casing. And I can't show you the, the side view because I think um, the camera's set up for this particular view, but when you put the bobbin casing back, there's sort of a round sort of wheel that goes around the casing. And if you take a look at it while you're sewing, that portion is moving around in a circle, kind of like a wheel, and there's a, a hook portion, and that's the portion that helps get the bobbin thread onto your um, thread on your top thread. So while you're sewing, it completes uh, a line of stitching. So I'm going to go ahead and put this back in here. Okay. So what happens? And it certainly doesn't happen every single time, but as you can see, it will happen once in a while, and that's super frustrating because it doesn't look like obviously the corner is cut off. So how to avoid that. So what happens when you're sewing, when you're sewing and when you go to sort of pivot your fabric, when you get that little mistake over there like that, what happens is obviously you'll be leaving your needle down, lifting your presser foot up and sort of rotating your fabric. What happens when it skips the stitch over there is while you're rotating your fabric, your thread is kind of shifting a little bit, your top thread, and it's not picking up the bobbin thread properly. And so how to avoid that, because you know obviously it happens every once in a while, not every single time. So I'm going to sew uh, and pivot a corner and show you how to avoid that. So it's super simple. So as you can see, my needle's fully down. I'm going to take the wheel on the side of my, my sewing machine and I'm going to turn it forward slowly. I'm not going to pick the needle up all the way out of the, the fabric. So the needle still needs to be through the fabric, but I'm approximately going to lift the needle uh, right before where the eye of the needle is where it's holding the thread. So just again, make sure the needle is in the fabric still. You're not pulling it out all the way. I'm going to lift my presser foot up like I normally would pivot my fabric like I would need to do for sewing the corner. Let me move this little thread out of the way. And then you can keep sewing on. So honestly, that's all you need to do to prevent this little skip stitch in the corner. And you can use this method for either sharp corners or rectangles like, the, like what I've done right here. Or you can use this method if you're sewing sort of a curved edge to avoid the skip stitches through the curve. Either way will work and again, all you need to do is partially lift the needle out of your fabric, not all the way, but um, slightly below. Uh, you still want that eye of the needle to be through your fabric. So hopefully that helped. Um, again, I said it would be a super simple uh, fix to this problem, but I think it's something that's happened to me in the past um, relatively frequently. And so I think this, this little tip will definitely help um, make top stitching better or even when you're just sewing the bottom of the bag to the body of the bag. I think um, having that avoidance of the skip stitch will be definitely um, annoyance saving in your sewing. So I hope you enjoyed that demonstration. Um, I'm going to be answering some questions live in just a second. So if you have a question for me, either a sewing related question, question about a notion or a tool, bag making question, Type your question in the comments right now, either on Facebook or YouTube, wherever you watch our show. Um, Danny will be collecting questions and I'll answer as many as I can live. Uh, let me grab a sip of water quickly. <clears throat> um, let's see, before we get over to the question, I, questions, I wanted to announce the winners of last week's giveaway. We had two winners last week, a live winner and then uh, the recording winner. So, the two winners were Mary Grace Knowlton and Donna Wiggenroth. So congratulations to you both. Um, Donna, if you wouldn't mind uh, sending me an email after the show so that I can get you set up with your prize. And my email is sarah at sosweetness.com and that's Sarah with no H. And I actually have eight prizes for tonight's show since uh, Christmas is coming. So um, a bunch of boxes of Orphil to give away tonight. So um, stay tuned for the giveaway at the end of the show. So uh, Danny, take it away with the questions. <clears throat> um, Karen had a question, approximately how much does long arm quilting cost? So it depends on the um, what you're having done. So edge to edge quilting, which means computerized quilting, um, which is the picture that um, 
I put up on the screen earlier. Danny, can you actually put that uh, the picture of the quilt back up on the screen, just the first picture, or just maybe take it down? So this is edge to edge quilting. As you can see, it's the same design, just replicated over the whole entire quilt. So the edge to edge quilting will be um, the less expensive of the two ba the two basic options. Oh, thank you. Uh, yeah, so obviously you can see it was just the same design replicated from side to side, top to bottom. <clears throat> okay, you can take that off the screen. And so the second option is custom quilting. So custom quilting is when the long armor just quilts different designs per section of the quilt or per block. So feathers or different type of filigree, even straight line. So often the custom design echoes the elements that are actually in the quilt. So that one's more expensive because there's lots more hands-on by the long arm quilter. So I have had a couple of quilts long armed in the past and those are, um, I think Violet's birthday quilt. When Violet was five years old, I had her birthday quilt custom long armed by a friend. And uh, I mean, the friend discount, she, this was an award winning quilter. I it was a lot of money for me at the time, but I splurged, uh, it was $500 for that particular custom long arming and they might even be more expensive than that. Uh, as I said, this was like a, the friend's discount. So um, edge to edge quilting, um, it still needs attention by the long armor, but it is a computerized, you know, the same design over the whole entire quilt. I would say maybe depending, again, it depends on the quilter, maybe 150 or up depending on the size of the quilt. Um, the size of the design um, and I'm not a long arm expert so um, that's just my personal experience over my limited quilts that I've had long armed in the past um, yeah that was the question uh, and says nice quilt how did you quilt it yeah that was uh, Judy Tucker uh, long armed that for me and it was uh, an edge to edge design the same design in both quilts the large one and the small one just uh, the design in the smaller one was shrunken down um, Trisha says, does the glitter add texture? Um, threw my glitter fabric on the floor. So the fabric didn't feel bumpy. Um, it was sort of a, a smooth, but not, how do I describe it? Not quite as smooth as just a plain quilting cotton, but um, I guess it was a tiny bit thicker, but I definitely didn't feel like a bunch of bumps on the fabric. Like years ago, I purchased some fabric with a design and glitter on it and it definitely felt like really rough so this is a little bit more smooth than some other glitter fabrics that I've purchased in my in the past. Um, Nikki's Crafty Life says how do you remove choco liner from wax canvas? Um, that's a good question. I've only worked wax canvas a, a couple of a few times. Uh, it's been a while since I've used my clover choco on the wax canvas. No you don't want to iron the wax canvas because it can remove some of the wax. Um, what I actually have done in the past that I can recall is I used a friction pen, which I know I don't usually use on the right side of the fabric, but um, basically using it on the wax canvas kind of ruins the pen, um, but it kind of leaves a, a mark in the wax that isn't leaving chalk or pen marks. It's sort of just as if you were creasing the wax canvas. I don't know if that's the best way, but that, that's just what I've done in the past. Um, if you've used a particular marking tool and you've used wax canvas before, let us know in the comments what marking tool that your preference is for when working on wax canvas. Um, to try alcohol. Oh, Danny's saying um, some of the comments have suggested to try alcohol to remove the, yeah. the there we go. Vernita, thank you, Vernita, um, try alcohol. Um, so thank you for those comments. Um, what was that question that was up on the screen? Oh, Clovis wanted to know if I make mini quilts. Um, actually earlier in this year, I made a paper pieced horse. It was sort of a small rectangle, um, but I haven't quilted it yet, but the plan is to make it a mini quilt so I can hang it on the wall. I made a couple of mini quilts. Um, definitely if I made a mini quilt, I would just quilt that on the machine myself since it's so small, but uh, yeah, I've made a few and it's, it's a lot of fun. Um, having a quick quilted project to make. Lori says, Sarah, have you ever worked with chalkboard fabric? How did you like it? Um, honestly, it's been years and I can't recall if I've reviewed it on the show. So let me write myself a note. Where can I write it? Let me, let me write myself a note and I will 
take a look and see if I can talk about it on a future show. I think my Annie's has chalkboard fabric, uh, but don't quote me on that. I'll have, to, I'll have to order some after the show, though. Margie says, I just got the corner rounding template. Are the curves based on the radii or the circumference of a corresponding circle? Um... Ed, I'm not sure if you're watching the show. Ed makes our templates. Uh, <laughs> I'll have to get back to you on that one. Um, not being a math person, and I don't have the, the template in front of me, I, I don't recall what which one it was. Feel free to email me after the show, though, and I'm happy to get the answer for you. Uh, my email is sarah at sosweetness.com, and that's Sarah with no H. Um, Elizabeth says, do you shorten your stitch for the corner? Um, in that example, I did not, but you could shorten the stitch if you would like to. Um, yeah, that, that, <laughs> I don't know where I was going with that, but yeah, yes, you could shorten the stitch if you would like, uh, but not necessary, especially if you're top stitching strap tabs and you want the stitch length to look uniform. Um, not necessary, but optional, I guess I'll say. Mary Ellen says, what is the bag with the green handle behind you? I'm not... You're right. Right, yeah. I forgot that I'm mirror image on, on the shows. I'm not sure if this is the one you're talking about with this handle. This is the gloss cosmetic bag from Minikin Season 2, and I, I can hear noises inside, so I, apparently I've left some things inside, <laughs> some travel uh, items, but it's great for going on a trip. There's a little loop on the top, so if you'd like to hang it, um, two storage portions up here. So this one's got mesh, this one's got clear vinyl, and then I've got, I, I don't know why I leave stuff in bags, but I've got like a travel toothpaste and a travel... Um, contact lens solution in there so um, yeah oh there's a there's a pocket on the front as well um, B says how long do you usually spend on selecting fabrics I probably spend honestly the fabric usually doesn't come to me right away so I would spend on average approximately 30 minutes selecting fabric just because depending on the bag I, I don't know like this chickadee backpack, as you can see, this this fabric worked, worked great for this bag because it's a large scale print, but the large scale isn't, you can still visually see the different features of the bag, which is what I like to try to do. Um, let's see what else. Uh, I'm trying to pick out the, a bag, like for instance, like even though I went with a smaller print on this bag, I kind of looked at the fabric beforehand to make sure, like as you can see, you can see a few of the cranes represented. Um, they're not cut off and you can see more than one, one row of the birds flying. So I don't know, I try to look at fabrics to see how they interact with the different portions of the bag and um, I don't know, looking at the different pattern pieces and the parts beforehand as well. See the cameras kind of got me blurred out there we go. Um, Mary Grace says, not a question, but a big thank you for the Oracle thread that you sent for my prize last week. I hope I'm... Put your hand up for a second. Yep. There we go. Um, I'm so happy the package arrived safely, and I hope you enjoy using um, that Oracle thread prize from last week. Um, Terry says, what are you and Danny hoping Santa brings for Christmas? Hi. Danny, are, is there anything that you're wishing for? William and I got to get, Danny's hard to shop for, so my son William and I got together for like a combined gift for Danny. Um, I just, I'm, a, honestly, I'm grateful for anything. Um, my friend sent me a, a blank journal that I got in the mail yesterday. Um, I loved the graphics on the front and I use uh, journaling for uh, like my mental health. So my therapist has me write in my journal every night before bed five things that I'm grateful for, and then I can also write additional things, like if um, I had a situation that uh, I was worried or stressed out about, because uh, his reasoning is whatever you're writing in your journal, you can look back on it, and then you can see that whatever you are stressed or panicked about, in a few weeks or a few months or it, sometime in the future, you'll read back on that journal entry and say, you know what? I was so stressed out about that and it actually wasn't so bad and it actually ended up working out or even if it doesn't work out, it's never as bad as you initially think in the moment. So that's what I use my journal for. Um, Robin says, have you thought about designing quilt patterns uh, for your collection? So years ago when I first designed bag patterns, I 
felt a little self-conscious because all of my friends that were also designers were designing quilt patterns. Um, I was the only, at the time when I first started designing, I was the only bag pattern that I personally knew, like that I was, not that I was friends with myself, but um, yeah, basically my friends were all quilt pattern designers. So I thought, I don't know, I just felt less than because I wasn't doing what everyone else was doing, but so in the meantime, at the beginning, I tried to design a, a few quilt patterns. They were, I, were, I would say most of them were mediocre. One of them in particular with uh, like applique fruits on it, that one was really embarrassing. Um, none of them were ever for sale. They were always for either a free quilt pattern or in a magazine. But um, I have since realized that quilt patterns are not my calling. I'm just not, not any good at them. Um, bags are my thing, so. Um, Thankfully, I stuck with the bags. <clears throat> Anita says, have you ever sewn fly ear protectors for horses? I have not, but I bet you there's probably a, a pattern on Etsy for that, so I'll have to take a look at that. I'll write myself a note so I can check it out after the show. Um, Dalva says, in your um, straight stitch machine, how do you adjust the presser foot tension? So at my Juki, there's a, a dial on the front of the machine with like a little window with a blue bar that goes up and down as you turn the dial. So that's on my Juki, that's the presser foot tension. Uh, depending on your machine, it might be in a different location, but um, you could check your sewing machine manual to find out how to adjust that on your machine. <clears throat> Um, Sarah wants to know how you line up rivets. They line up when I mark them, but uneven after hole punching them. So sometimes I have this problem also. Um, like Sarah says, marking them is the easier part, but then getting them to line up perfectly um, after you've inserted them is perhaps more difficult. Um, I try to punch my hole with my rivet press uh, directly on top of the dot. I suppose you could um, draw what would you call it? Placement markings to either side of the dot also to make sure as you put your rivet through the fabric that it's sort of aligned um, and you, you just want to divide the width of your rivet times two so you can make a line on either side. Um, if, However, if anyone has any tips for better lining up rivets as you're inserting them into the fabric, let us know in the comments and Danny will try to look out for them. Jennifer says, I'm having trouble getting the tension right when sewing through multiple layers of cork fabric. I have a Juki 2010Q, any tips? So <clears throat> my tip would be to get some scraps of the same fabric that you're using for your project and the same thickness. So for, for instance, if you have the cork fabric in your finished project, if it will be attached to interfacing, make your scraps that same thickness so that you can work off of what you will actually be working on in your project because they change from project to project potentially. And then just go through adjusting your tension on those scraps on your sewing machine. Um, if you are starting a new project, um, change out to um, a new sewing machine needle. Um, if it's a thick layer of fabric, um, increase your stitch length to your usual top stitching length. Um, my stitch length for top stitching is usually three millimeters. It might be different for your sewing machine. Um, but just work with the scraps first before you move on to your project so that you don't have um, holes left in your fabric and you can feel more confident uh, when moving over to um, the actual fabric for your project. Um, when designing a pattern, do you have a purpose or a person in mind at the onset? That's a really great question. Um, a lot of my patterns are either, how do I say this? D design challenges for me, meaning like, oh, I would like to, I would really like to figure out how to implement something like that. So for instance, this type of pocket on the chickadee, I use this for I originally used this for the widget messenger bag, this type of pocket that's attached to the front of the bag. And so when I was working on the widget bag, my I like the bag as a whole, but my um, design challenge to myself was, how do I get something like that on the project how I want it? So that was the excitement for me of working on that particular pattern. <coughs> um, I also like to come up with patterns for particular uses, like that glass cosmetic bag that I was sharing earlier. 
Um, or the Creative Maker Supply Case, which is great for holding a sketchbook or a coloring book and colored pencils. Um, so a lot of times I'm really interested in those very specific bags for a particular use or like the best friend pet carrier, a pet carrier. So I'm also interested in besides bags with interesting features, I'm interested in, um, as you've mentioned, the bags with particular uses. Um, Tracy says, any tips on sewing the tulip pink webbing? So, uh, well, for one thing, I do my best to blend whatever threads that I have on hand, the closest that I can to the webbing. Um, if you need it, you might find it helpful to switch out to your walking foot for sewing the webbing. In a lot of instances, I'm assuming you might be sewing the webbing to the front of the bag and sometimes the layers get thick, so sometimes a walking foot will be helpful with that. Um, and what else? Um, I often like to seal the cut ends of webbing, whether I'm using the tulip pink webbing or another type of webbing, with um, a seam sealant or either heat sealing. Um, just to minimize the fraying while I'm trying to work with it. Um, Kathy says, which do you prefer, the easy point and turner or the fast turn tool? So I actually have those across the room, so I'm unfortunately not able to show those to you on camera right, right now. Um, I would say I use them both equally, and I know that's probably not, not the answer you're looking for. You're probably looking for me to direct you to one or the other. Um, I really like the fast turn tool for turning. I probably use them 50-50, I'd have to say. Um, even though if you had to go with one or the other, I would go with the easy point and turner just because besides turning tubes of fabric or turning little strap tabs, it can do other things like... Um, inserting elastic into a casing. It has multiple uses. So if you're interested in checking those out, I have a video showing all of the uses for the Easy Point and Turner um, on my website or YouTube channel. And um, we, I believe we also have a video for the Fast Turn tool. So you can check out me demonstrating both of those tools if you're sort of on the fence and perhaps the videos will be helpful to see which one you're most interested in. <clears throat> Anne says, any tips or tricks you can share about top stitching? I made the Creative Maker case and ended up not, to, not top stitching it because I couldn't get the top and bottom to both look good. Love your patterns, thanks. So <clears throat> my number one thread, uh, my, number one <laughs> my number one tip for top stitching is to match your top and bobbin threads. So for instance, and I happen to do this on this Gloss Cosmetic bag, so I'm thankful for that. So I can show you on camera. So when I top stitch this this flat portion over here, I matched my top thread to my exterior fabric. So my top thread is actually lime green, so it blends in a little bit. And my bobbin thread, I matched it to the lining fabric. So my bobbin thread is, it's either a white or an ivory color. So I use two different colors of thread. Um, that's something really easy you can do, matching uh, the top and the bottom threads so that they match the fabrics to your project. I like I know sometimes when people are top stitching, they're looking for the stitching to stand out, but because I'd like to worry less about the perfection of my top stitching, I like my threads to blend in as close as possible. So that's why I use the different, th the different colored threads for the top stitching. Um, <coughs> excuse me. I like to um, increase my stitch length for top stitching. Um, three millimeters on my machine, your machine might be different, but. You can always do a little practice so before you start with the top stitching. Depending on your machine, you might find it helpful to swap out your walking foot because the walking foot can help work with the feed dogs to evenly feed the fabric through your machine, especially with very thick areas and for also for thick seams, such as on the side of the bag. Um, a Gina Majig might work. Um, we have one in stock on the website as well. And a Gina Majig just helps sort of jump over that thick seam and make sure your stitches are an, an equal proportion throughout the, the whole entire of the top stitching. All right, Danny is calling in on the questions, so I apologize if I did not get to your questions live, but Danny and I will be back again next Sunday 
on the show answering more questions. Okay, so I have these eight boxes of Aurifil thread for tonight's giveaway. So we'll do, why don't we do six live winners and we'll do six winners where you'll have the usual week to enter for the giveaway. So for the randomly drawn winners, we choose um, among the comments, our software combines the comments between Facebook and YouTube and every comment that you've left on the show is uh, a form of entry. So um, if you have not le yet left a comment on tonight's show, um, I have an extra question for you, which you can answer in the, the comments right now live. My question is, what's your favorite color for purse hardware? So go ahead and type the answer to this question right now, either on Facebook or YouTube, wherever you're watching the show. Um, I In just a second, I will draw six randomly drawn winners for these boxes of thread and then we'll have two winners which we'll announce on next Sunday's show. So you'll have, in addition to that, until the end of the day this Saturday to leave a comment on the show and um, they're all randomly drawn winners. So let's see. <clears throat> all right, Danny, what numbers am I choosing from for the live winners? One through 73, no, 75. One through 75, so I'm gonna go with uh, 61. One and 20. 1 through 20, um, number 4. Okay, so Lizette Morgan is our first winner of, let me write her name down, <clears throat> this box of Oriflame threads. It is, let me pull it open, um, a black, white, and a gray spool of thread. And this is 40 weight thread, so this is the thread that I use for bag making the green spool. So I'm not gonna pull all of the threads out because I think that'll take a while, but um, I just wanted to pull that first box out so they could see it's 40 weight thread. So congratulations to Lizette. Uh, by the way, everyone who's won live, please email me after the show and I will get you uh, set up with your prize. All right, the second live winner will be for um, this box of gray threads. So I'm gonna go with number uh, 57. No, it's one through one now. One through 93. Uh, we'll, still, we'll still go with 57. All right. Three different spools of gray thread. One through <clears throat> uh, Five. All right, Elaine is our second winner of the gray box of Aurifil, so congratulations to Elaine. All right, um, giveaway number three will be um, a purple box of Aurifil. Let me pull that out. Um, Danny, I'm going to give you number 11, and these are three spools of purple threads. Um, one. <laughs> All right, Susan Kohler, congratulations to you, Susan. And again, every everyone who's won, please email me after the show, sarah at sosweetness.com. All right, our fourth winner is going to be this brown box. I'm going to go with the number uh, 42 for... Our fourth winner, different shades of brown, um, number eight. All right, Melissa is our fourth winner. Congratulations to you, Melissa. All right. Our fifth live winner is going to be this box of lime orifil threads. Three different shades of green. Um, we'll go with number 32. Uh, two. All right, Elisette, congratulations to you. All right, and our last live winner is going to be this box of pink Aurifil threads. This is what the threads look like inside, and I'm going to choose number hmm, 80, 81, and number three. All right, Carol B, congratulations to Carol and everyone, please, uh, everyone who's won, please email me after the show so that I can have your contact information. Um, my email is sarahsosweetness.com. And the two boxes I have left, which will be drawn uh, at the end of the day this Saturday, are um, yellow and sort of a teal color. So um, be sure to um, leave your comments, uh, answer to my question in the comments. Um, again, the question was, Thank you. 
what's your favorite color for purse hardware? So I hope you've enjoyed Social Sunday. Thank you so much for tuning in for the show. I hope you have a great week and happy sewing. Bye, everybody. Thank you.